going to tell you a little bit about Mark Maurer. He's one of the country's leading experts in on sentencing policy, race, and, criminal, and the criminal justice system. He's directed programs on criminal justice policy reform for over 30 years and is the author of some of the most widely cited reports and publications in the field, including Young Black Men in the Criminal Justice System and the Americans Behind Bar series. In 1995, on the racial disparity in criminal justice system, he led the New York Times uh, editorial report that, quote, should set off alarm bells for the White House to City Hall and help reverse the notion that we can incarcerate our way out of the fundamental social problems. Um, we, we do have copies of his um, latest groundbreaking book, Race to Incarcerate. It's on how sentencing policies led to the explosion, explosive expansion of the U.S. prison population. Uh, it was the winner, uh, was a semifinalist for the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award in 1999. Um, Mr. Maurer is also the co-editor of The Invisible Punishment, a 2002 collection of essays by prominent criminal justice experts on the social cost of imprisonment. Um, he's worked with, in the criminal justice with, he started out his work with the American Friends Service Committee in 1975 and served as the organization's National Justice Communications Coordinator since then, he's been with the Sentencing Project since 1987, has testified before Congress and a lot of state legislatures. Um, in addition to that, uh, Mr. Maurer has received numerous awards. Uh, he's a graduate of Stony Brook University where he received his bachelor's degree. Maurer earned his master's of social work from the University of Michigan. We won't hold that against him though. <laughs> So without, without further ado, I'll just introduce Mark Maurer. Thanks. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Um, I've come to appreciate the importance of getting the introduction right. Um, Isidore mentioned my book, Race to Incarcerate, and when the book was first published, I was giving a talk at one of the bookstores in Washington, and a newsletter went out, said, uh, Mark Maurer will speak about his new book, Race to Incinerate. So uh, <laughs> those are important issues as well, but uh, I'm not going to talk about them today. Um, my thanks as well to uh, Judge O'Brien. I don't know if I've ever been called a rock star before, uh, but I have always wanted to be a rock star, but in the more traditional way, not writing a manual on racial disparity, but it will take it any way we can get it. Um, I always enjoy uh, coming to Madison, um, although sometimes it's more successful than others. The last time I was invited here was several years ago. Uh, my friend sister Esther called me up and said, uh, asked if I could speak at a criminal justice reform conference, and I was delighted to do that, of course. And I said, uh, when is the conference taking place? And she said, well, it's in early February. And like a fool, it never occurred to me to probe a little more about whether that was a good idea or not. Um, so when I got here on Friday evening, there were already eight inches of snow on the ground, and I'll spare you all the details of the weekend, but it did involve uh, sleeping on the floor of O'Hare Airport one of the nights, too. So um, April is a delightful time to be here. I'm very happy to do that. Uh, I'm particularly glad to be here uh, talking about racial disparities. Uh, you know, you've heard some wonderful uh, commentary so far on uh, the progress and the depth of leadership that you have on these issues. Um, there's been some comparison to the fact that there's very little else one can identify in the rest of Wisconsin. Uh, the good news and the bad news is, uh, you know, I look at these issues across the country. Um, I can't think of very many counties anywhere that have taken on this issue uh, in as serious and substantial way uh, as you have here in Dane County, which doesn't mean for a moment that we've solved the problem or that we're on the cusp of solving it, but 
Uh, this takes a lot of hard work. Uh, what we need is counties, obviously, across the country looking at these issues. So the good news, I think, is that uh, you're beginning to create a model of sorts of how you can do this with the report, with the leadership, with the implementation of programs and policies. Uh, it certainly helps me in my job when people are looking at ways that they can take on these issues uh, to have examples like Dane County to look at. And so I really do congratulate you and I know this is not, this is very hard work and it's particularly important to sustain it over a period of time and I think you all know that very well. Uh, what I want to talk about this morning is to try to first look at the big picture of uh, where racial disparities come from. What do we know about them in the 21st century? Uh, and if we have a sense of where they come from, that should give us some idea of how we can address it and how do we get uh, beyond some of these issues. Um, and let me begin with um, a story about a friend of mine. Uh, my friend and his wife, uh, are the parents to three teenage kids, a boy and two girls. Uh, and a couple of years ago, their teenage son started being a teenage son. Uh, so he was staying out late at night. He was smashing up the family car every now and then. Uh, his grades in school were going down. There may have been some drinking or drug use going on. And then one night, they get a call from the police saying that their son has just been arrested for shoplifting from a convenience store. So they go down to the police station and they pick him up and bring him home. And over the next couple of weeks, they had some serious talks with their son. Uh, they knew he was having some problems. He knew he was having problems. They found a social worker who uh, the son was amenable to meeting with. And they spent some time initially with the police and then the prosecutor assigned to the case describing what they were doing as a family and basically letting them, the prosecutor, know that um, that they had a social worker and they thought they could work things through as a family and their son was uh, open to doing that. And the prosecutor basically said, you know, that sounds like a reasonable thing to do. Why don't you go ahead and do that? It's only a first time shoplifting charge. So, you know, I will, I'll drop the charges and, and we'll take care of that. Well, the son goes on, spends time with the social worker, and lo and behold, things start to improve. His grades are going up, and he's getting along better with his family, and eventually uh, he goes off to a good college and is seemingly on his way to a good middle-class lifestyle and whatever he chooses to do. Well, on the same night that my friend's son was arrested, I would imagine not very far away, there was another teenage boy arrested also, only this boy... His parents may not have had either the resources or the negotiating skills to work with the system to come up with another plan and bring a private social worker into the process. Now, you're not going to get heavy prison time in your first time shoplifting charge, but uh, he's going to be, he may have to end up paying a fine and doing some community service work or something like that. Uh, but six months later, he gets picked up for breaking into a car or a larceny or something like that. And all of a sudden he starts to look like one of these habitual offenders that we hear about and he starts to go down a very different path than my friend's son is going down. So we have two teenage boys, similar behaviors, and yet when we talk about issues of race and justice, we're also talking about race and social class and we're talking about the resources that go into problem solving. Some of this is a criminal justice issue, some of this is a broader community issue and how we address these issues, uh, I think we have to look more broadly at what are the ways we can go about solving some of these problems. So if we want to look at the big picture, uh, just to refresh our minds, um, here's the, the story of incarceration in the United States. We start in 1925, and for a period of almost 50 years, the number of people in prison is relatively steady. It goes up somewhat during the Depression years, down a little bit during World War II. Uh, and beginning in 1972, here's what happens then. Uh, we have this very dramatic, completely unprecedented rise. We add more than a million people uh, to our state and federal prisons during this period of time. Uh, to put some perspective on that, the United States has now become the world leader in its rate of incarceration. Uh, number two is our old Cold War rival, Russia. 
Uh, but if we compare the U.S. to other industrialized nations, Canada, Western Europe, uh, we lock up our citizens at about five or eight times the rate of other industrialized nations. And there's something fundamentally wrong with this picture. Regardless of one's political perspective, uh, the United States prides itself on its democratic traditions. We're the wealthiest society in the world. There's some kind of disconnect here that we also have the world's highest rate of incarceration. Um, we also know that incarceration doesn't cut across the board equally, and we know that there's very uh, serious disparities, as we've discussed this morning. And this is research from the Justice Department that shows us the likelihood of imprisonment. This was from a study of males born in 2001. Uh, if current trends continue, one of every three African-American males born today can expect to do time in prison, one of every six Latino males, one of every 17 white males. The figures for women overall are lower, but the racial ethnic disparities are very similar. So one in three black males, one in six Latino males can expect to go to prison in his lifetime. Uh, this is not just a question of concern for minority communities. This is not, these numbers uh, are not an indication of a healthy society, and there's all sorts of ramifications uh, for whatever set of policies and practices and history has led to this situation. So it's clearly a challenge for all of us uh, to be uh, addressing these issues. So the challenge is, you know, how do we understand these numbers? Where do they come from? Well, for many people, uh, the answer would be very simple. It would be basically you do the time, you do, you do the crime, you do the time, and we must see higher rates of crime in minority communities that explains these disparities that we see. So what do we know about that? Well, African Americans are about 13% of the national population. If we look at arrest rates, which is about as close as we can get to crime rates, uh, African Americans are about 30% of people arrested for a property offense, about 40% people arrested for a violent offense. So we see some clear disparities there. Uh, we don't have to look very deep, though, to see that what may appear to be a racial effect is really a one of social class for the most part. We're talking about poverty, concentrated poverty, the disadvantages that come along uh, in communities uh, that have uh, sustained poverty uh, and all the ripple effects that come out of that. So clearly that begins to point to where we need to look to remedy these problems. Uh, but we also know that there's much to look at in terms of policy and practice within the criminal justice system. Now, the Jim Crow era is long gone. Uh, we, you know, it's not commonplace now, as it may have been uh, a half century ago, to hear you know, very direct racist comments made in the courtroom or in the back of the police station or something like that. Doesn't mean it's disappeared entirely, but many things have changed in the last half century, and yet racial dynamics in the criminal justice system still persist, and I think they persist for three different kinds of reasons. Uh, one is, you know, racism is still alive and well in America, and it rears its ugly head in different ways at times. Secondly, it's how we use discretion in the criminal justice system, how we allocate resources, uh, whether conscious or not, and what uh, outcomes that may produce. And third is the impact of what we might think of as race-neutral policies uh, that may seem reasonable on the surface and yet have a racial effect that probably could have been anticipated had we taken the time to look at that. So how do we see this playing out? Well, we get begin in the area of law enforcement. You know, clearly, uh, you know, we've uh, have we had racial profiling. Well, as long as uh, black people have been driving cars, we've had racial profiling. It's only in the last 10 or 15 years that we see significant documentation of what this looks like. And just to be clear, uh, when we talk about racial profiling, we are not talking about all police agencies and certainly not all law enforcement officers, but unfortunately, uh, in far too many instances, we now have, as shown in, in litigation in courts and elsewhere, uh, racial profiling still does exist. Uh, the good news is that 
uh, in, uh, among law enforcement leadership, particularly in the last 10 or 15 years. There's been, I think, significant level of attention to this problem, uh, strategic approaches, how do you evaluate, how do you collect data, how do you monitor, train, and deal with personnel issues to counter uh, any instance of this taking place. Um, <clears throat> when we get to the court system uh, sentencing, uh, certainly at the extreme ends, uh, we have a lot of research that shows us on imposition of the death penalty. Uh, race is one of the key factors in determining who is sentenced to death as opposed to life imprisonment. And race plays out there primarily through the race of the victim. Uh, studies going back 25 years now have shown us that uh, if you kill a white person, your chances of receiving death penalty are at least four times that uh, as if you kill a black person and controlling for all relevant variables there. Uh, when it comes to non-capital cases, it begins to get a little more complicated. There are some studies that show that there are racial effects at sentencing, and some studies say there's no racial effect. Um, what the more sophisticated studies show is that it's often race in combination with other factors, race and gender, employment issues and others, uh, that tell us something about how these racial outcomes are produced. Uh, and we can see it in, in several different ways. Um, you know, let's imagine, for a start, I'm a judge. Uh, I've got two people I'm about to sentence for a burglary charge. One is black, one is white. Uh, in both cases, there's an underlying problem of substance abuse. Uh, the attorney for the first defendant comes before me and says, you know, Your Honor, here's the burglary. Uh, it's related to the substance abuse problem. The, my client's family can get him into a treatment program. We think we can deal with this. And the judge uh, may be very receptive to doing that in terms of getting at the underlying problem. Uh, defendant B, again, doesn't have those resources, and so for public safety reasons, the judge may be reluctant to not incarcerate that person uh, if we're not dealing with the underlying problem. So is this race, is it class, is it resources? How do we level the playing field so that the outcome in one case becomes the preferred outcome across the board? It shouldn't have to depend on what you can bring to the system itself. We see it in terms of what we might think of as unconscious bias, uh, let's call it that. Um, a study in Washington State uh, was looking at pre-sentence reports in juvenile cases, and what they looked at here was uh, the narrative section of the report that went to the judge, basically where the probation officer was describing the youth uh, in terms of background information, so the judge would have uh, more, uh, more information by which to consider uh, detention issues and, and what to do with the young man. Uh, and what they found was that the white youth tended to be described as having environmental problems. In other words, they weren't getting along with their family, they were acting up in school, various kinds of things, problems in their day-to-day -day settings and all that. The black youth were much more likely to be described as having antisocial personalities. Now, what's the effect of this distinction? Well, if you're having environmental problems, there's something that we can try to do about that. You know, we can bring in family counselors. We can get you tutors to help you get through school. We can have dispute resolution programs in the community or so. We can try to address your behavioral issues through interventions that we have available to us. On the other hand, if you're described as having an antisocial personality, we can't give you a new personality, right? Uh, that young person becomes defined as a threat, dangerous to the community, and it's probably going to appear the only thing <clears throat> we can do is to keep the person behind bars to protect the community. Now, are there young people with antisocial personalities? Yes, there are. And they're black, white, Latino, Asian, they cut across the board. Uh, it's unlikely that uh, youth of color uh, suffer from this much more so than anyone else does. So uh, how these messages and images and biases play out uh, tells us something about what these outcomes look like as well. We see it also uh, in terms of some of these race-neutral policies that, uh, that may add up to produce disparities as well. 
uh, there was a intriguing case in federal court some time ago. Uh, this was a case in Boston, uh, federal judge uh, Gertner. Uh, there was a man, uh, Mr. Levener, uh, who was uh, arrested and charged with possession of a weapon. Uh, it was a federal case. Um, because in the federal systems, you know, they have a system of sentencing guidelines. So based on his current offense and his prior record, he had a number of prior offenses, uh, he was looking at six years in prison. Um, Judge Gerdner looked at his prior record, he was an African American man living in Boston, and found that several of his prior convictions resulted from traffic stops by the police. The police stopped him, they found a gun in the car. The police stopped him, they found drugs in the car. And she didn't question the validity of these prior convictions, they all seemed reasonable. Uh, but her reasoning was there had been a significant history of racial profiling in law enforcement in Boston neighborhoods that he lived in over a period of time. Her reasoning was that as an African American man driving around in Boston, he was more likely to be stopped by the police and then therefore more likely to acquire a criminal record. Uh, and so she essentially discounted part of that, sentenced him to two years in prison rather than the six years which gets to be very uh, problematic and challenging in some ways. On the one hand, if people are convicted in court, uh, there needs to be some consequences to their behavior. At the same time, we don't want those consequences to be disproportionate based on actions by the criminal justice system. So it raises some very uh, sort of troubling dilemmas for all of us, I think. Um, it also gets at a sort of broader problem of sentencing and, and how we use a prior record. Uh, you know, many states have various kinds of habitual offender laws, three strikes and you're out laws, and even if they don't, uh, typically in court, uh, if you're a judge sentencing somebody with prior convictions, that is generally taken into account, and generally speaking, you're gonna get a little bit more of a punitive sentence if you've got a prior record than if you don't. And you know, there's, that's not necessarily objectionable. But if we have a situation where people of color are more likely to have a prior record, whether it's because of poverty, racism, racial profiling, whatever combination of circumstances, are we inadvertently resulting, having a result where we have harsher sentences in minority communities based on other kinds of factors that may or may not reflect just individual involvement in crime or choices, things like that. Again, a challenging issue to take on uh, for all of us. Um, what we've seen over um, the last quarter century or so now, of course, the most significant uh, change in the justice system, most significant impact <clears throat> on racial disparities has been the whole uh, war on drugs beginning around the mid-1980s or so. Uh, so it's been the most significant for two reasons. One, it's been the biggest contributor to our incarcerated population. And secondly, uh, it's had the most significant impact on communities of color. Now the big picture here, uh, back in 1980, there were about 40,000 people in prison or jail for a drug offense, 40,000. Today that figure is 500,000 people behind bars for a drug offense. Uh, to put some perspective on that, there are more people locked up for a drug offense today than the entire prison and jail population back in 1980. Um, now why, um, let me just say, of those people behind bars for a drug offense, about two-thirds are black or Hispanic, two-thirds. So the question is, why would we see such significant racial disparities uh, when it comes to drug offending, uh, drug incarceration? Well, several reasons. One, uh, when we look at drug offenses, uh, unlike offenses like murder, rape, robbery, where there's no question uh, when those crimes are reported, there will be a police response and a significant police response in any community in the country. When it comes to drug crimes, uh, the law enforcement and community response is very discretionary. Uh, so you could have uh, City A 
and the police chief and the mayor there say, <clears throat> we are going to go after drug issues by trying to get the kingpins who are bringing drugs into this community, and if we can do that successfully, we think we can slow uh, the rate of drugs coming in and substance abuse. Uh, City B, the mayor and the police chief say, uh, zero tolerance is our strategy. Uh, we will arrest anybody with any connection to drugs, including the kid who's walking down the street smoking a joint and everybody else. And many cities are somewhere in between those two extremes. Well, there's not necessarily a right or wrong way to approach this, but depending on what decisions are made about how to prosecute the drug war, will have a very significant effect on what the numbers look like and the racial dynamics that come out of it, which neighborhoods are patrolled and the like. And there's nothing really new about this uh, in terms of the most, the current drug war that we're in right now. Uh, if we go back over 100 years, various kinds of drug wars, uh, if you look at the history of marijuana policy in this country, for example, uh, back in the 1930s, Marijuana was viewed as a sort of demon drug, uh, sort of the reefer madness days, and marijuana was viewed as a drug that was used in nightclubs in the kind of racy parts of town, uh, you know, nightclubs where African Americans were and uh, Hispanic areas of town, things like that. Whether or not this was accurate, that was the public perception of who was using marijuana. Um, along come the 1960s, and all of a sudden, millions of white middle-class kids start using marijuana in great numbers, and almost overnight, public attitudes about the drug begin to change very quickly. So we have calls for decriminalization, and marijuana becomes very celebrated in popular culture and, and the like. Well, Nothing had changed about the drug. It was just a change in the perception of the user, and all of a sudden we had different societal attitudes about how we should respond to this drug. Um, more recent times, uh, the, the drug policies beginning in the 1980s, uh, we've seen the most extreme response probably in the notorious federal penalties, mandatory sentencing for crack cocaine. Many of you are probably familiar with this. Uh, but in response to this new drug, crack cocaine, that came on the scene in the mid-1980s, Congress, in virtual record time, passed very harsh sensing policy. So under the mandatory sensing laws, if you were caught selling 500 grams, about a pound of powder cocaine, you would get a mandatory five years in prison, but for crack cocaine, all that was required was possessing five grams, the weight of about two pennies, to get that same mandatory five-year prison term. Well, whether conscious or not, uh, people arrested for crack offenses, more than 80% have been African-American. For powder cocaine, they've been much more likely to be white or Latino. So we've had huge racial disparities, not to mention uh, very ineffective drug policies. When you're requiring judges to send someone to prison for five years for possessing as little as five grams of the drug, that's not a very effective strategy. Uh, finally, last year, after really 20 years of, of agitation and sort of across the board, uh, opposition <coughs> from legal groups and civil rights groups and others, Congress, substantially scaled back the penalty. So this 100 to 1 disparity in the quantity of drugs was scaled back to 18 to 1. It's not as far as I think it should have gone, but it was a significant change nonetheless. Um, we see some of the racial disparities in drug policies um, coming out in other ways too, and again, ways that might appear to be race neutral on the surface, but have a very clear racial outcome. Um, many states have uh, policies called drug-free school zones, uh, states, local governments, and all that, where basically uh, the idea behind it is not objectionable. <clears throat> um, you know, no parent wants uh, drug dealers uh, coming on the schoolyard at lunchtime and selling drugs to their kids, right? It's hard to argue with that. Uh, but in many instances, the drug-free school zone laws are written in very expansive way. So sometimes it may be that the zone area extends as far as a thousand feet from the school. In some cases, uh, it doesn't even need to, the offense doesn't need to take place during school hours. So you could have uh, 
a drug transaction between two consenting adults at two in the morning that happens to be near a school zone, and it could be p penalized as a school zone drug offense. Now, um, why is this a racial effect too? Well, in urban areas and, and communities of color disproportionately are located in urban areas, we have very densely populated neighborhoods. So if you have a school zone law that goes for 1,000 feet, uh, large parts of any urban area are likely to be within a school zone, much more so than rural or suburban areas. So if you commit a drug offense in an urban area, it's far more likely to be subject to the school zone law than in a suburban or rural area. So much so that the state of New Jersey, just a few years ago, a study was done showed that 96% of the people charged with these offenses were African American or Latino. Uh, not necessarily they were 96% of all the drug sellers in the state, but the school zone laws disproportionately affected them, uh, which actually led the New Jersey legislature last year to amend the law now to ju give judges discretion in implementing it based on the circumstances of the case. I should add as well, um, while the war on drugs uh, policies are still very much <clears throat> with us, um, we have seen, I think, some significant changes in recent years. In part, I think there's a growing recognition that we can not fight the problem of drug abuse merely by incarcerating hundreds of thousands of people. and. The support for drug courts and various kinds of treatment approaches is really widespread around the country now. Uh, we're still not seeing the diversionary potential that I think we should see from that in terms of removing people from prison in significant numbers, but nonetheless, I think the public, public attitudes have changed on this as well. Uh, we see it coming from the top also. Uh, our current drug czar in the Obama administration, Gil Kurlikowski, a lifelong Law enforcement leader, uh, shortly after coming to office, basically said, uh, <clears throat> we are not going to call this a war on drugs anymore. You don't declare war on your own population. We have a problem of substance abuse, and that's the problem that we're going to address. So, um, you know, we need to think about how we frame the problem, and by doing that, how we frame the kinds of solutions that we want to try to come up with as well. So what do we do about this, and what do we see around the country um, that gives us some thoughts about how we can look at some of these issues? Um, well, there are some people who would say, um, you know, we can't deal with these problems until we end poverty and racism. I'm fully in agreement with that. That's clearly what's driving many of the numbers we see. At the same time, that doesn't get us very far. You know, yes, we all need to be working on poverty and racism, but uh, it doesn't mean that there are not things we could do each and every day at various points within the justice system and outside to make at least incremental change. And if we can make incremental change, that's, that's a direction we need to start, even as we look at the big picture. So where do we, how do we look at that in, in the justice system? Well, uh, I'll, I'll tell you one story. Um, I had a call some time ago from a prison warden in a Midwest state. Um, he was a warden in a minimum security prison. This was a prison uh, where people, prisoners who were on their way home, they'd been in higher level, higher security prisons up until then, now came into this prison because they were within 12 months of going home, their exit date. And uh, people in that prison were eligible to apply for a weekend furlough uh, to go home and visit with their families. And they had a little sort of risk assessment form that they gave out to prisoners who wanted to go home, and they filled that out, and then they determined who would qualify for the furlough. And the warden was, uh, was kind of upset, and it is why he called me, and he said, there's something going on here because basically – the white prisoners are qualifying for the furlough and the black prisoners are not qualifying for it. And he said, you know, on the surface, uh, there shouldn't be any difference. We've already made a decision that all of these people are within 12 months of going home. They're all in a minimum security prison. They should be at a relatively similar risk level. Uh, he said there must be something going on in the risk assessment instrument we're using that somehow... 
consciously or not, is screening some people in and some people out of this whole process. Um, so we don't know what that was in that case. We do know another case, uh, this is in, at the pretrial level, uh, how risk assessment instruments uh, can influence some of these outcomes too. You know, risk assessment has become a uh, very popular, very standard thing to do in various aspects of criminal justice uh, as a way to make better decisions, and often it's been a good tool for doing that, but um, just saying we're doing risk assessment doesn't mean that it's always the right instrument or the right way to proceed. So in Minnesota, Hennepin County, basically uh, Minneapolis area, the pretrial services program was using risk assessment uh, criteria to make a recommendation to the judge about who should be uh, considered for uh, release on recognizance after they'd been arrested. And they also were finding they had significant racial disparities that were coming out of using this instrument. And they basically were using nine, uh, risk assessment of nine factors in terms of community uh, connections, and they'd never really validated those factors. And when they went back and tested it, <coughs> they found that three of the nine factors were highly correlated with race, but didn't say anything about the failure to appear rate in court. So basically, if you're judging who's going to show up in court, it didn't help you with that, but it did help to screen out African-American defendants. So clearly, they needed to uh, recognize that was not a useful way to go. So they can look at those kinds of things. Um, we've seen. A lot of work has been done in juvenile justice system. Uh, many of you are familiar with the work of the Annie Casey Foundation and its Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative. A number of jurisdictions um, in Oregon, Multnomah County, Portland, um, has had fairly good success in reducing the numbers of kids in detention overall and reducing the number of minority kids in detention as well. Part of it there, too, is uh, some risk assessment changes. When they had to make decisions about detention there, some of the questions that were asked uh, inadvertently were screening out some kids from the process. So, for example, one of the uh, questions that they had a uh, document was whether uh, the youth had a, quote, good family structure. Well, you know, not all of us are born with a good family structure. You know, it's kind of a matter of luck what you family come into. And it was screening out too many minority kids. And so they changed that from good family structure to having a responsible adult who could oversee your behavior. A responsible adult might be a minister, a baseball coach, teacher, or somebody else. But if the idea is that we're going to have an adult uh, looking after you, uh, yes, ideally you might want it to be a mother or father, but it doesn't necessarily need to be that way. Um, they also looked at criteria where there was gang affiliation and found that uh, in far too many instances, the definition of gang affiliation was very much correlated with which neighborhood you came from rather than a very focused attempt to look at whether this young person actually was a member of the gang or not. So they wanted to look much more carefully at that. We see as well um, in recent years, there's some mention this morning that uh, much of the increase in prison admissions uh, now in the last 10 or 15 years is not so much more people being admitted to prison, but either staying long in prison or having their parole or probation revoked, being sentenced back to prison. So about one of every three pre people going to prison today is going on a violation of probation or parole. Um, some studies have shown that African Americans are more likely to be violated than whites are. Uh, and here, too, we have a situation where parole officers in many jurisdictions have an enormous amount of discretion available to them. Many of them use it responsibly, but in many cases, there's very little oversight into how they exercise that discretion may contribute to disparity. So as a result, a number of states are now looking at how they can make better use of discretion with parole officers and how they can try to reduce the overall number of revocations to prison. Uh, Kansas is one state that's 
uh, taken the lead on this. Um, basically, they found it was just too easy for the parole officers sometimes just throw up their hands and just say, we're going to send the guy back to prison for the remaining two years of his sentence or so. And so they've instituted first a system of graduated sanctions, giving people, uh, parole officers, a choice between doing nothing, uh, sending them back for the full ends, having something in between to do. There's much more oversight now. They need to get sign off by supervisors. Nothing very fancy, but it's made a very significant difference in reducing the numbers of violations. On the policy level, the statewide level, um, we've been engaged with uh, several states in recent years in developing uh, basically policies called racial impact statements to look at how we should deal with criminal justice and sentencing policies in particular. And the idea behind this is that these are very similar to fiscal impact statements or environmental impact statements, which are now very common in public policy, and basically say that you know before we implement a new policy, we should try to anticipate uh, what some of the unintended outcomes might be. And it's better to try to do this in advance rather than wait till uh, after the problem has developed. Uh, you know, the classic case in criminal justice are the crack cocaine penalties that I mentioned before. Um, Congress raised through these penalties in record time. We have 80% of the people affected African American. No discussion whatsoever about what the impact of those penalties might be, and it took 25 years to finally remedy that problem. So racial impact statement legislation basically says if we're adopting new criminal penalties, um, let's do a legislative analysis that will project the impact on the prison population and break that down in terms of racial ethnic impact. And if you find there's a racial impact, it doesn't mean that you can't go ahead and adopt the legislation, but it hopefully will cause legislators to consider whether they can achieve their public safety goals without exacerbating the racial disparities we currently have. So in 2008, states of Iowa and Connecticut both adopted legislation to incorporate racial impact statements. Uh, in Minnesota, the Sensing Guidelines Commission does this internally, provides the information to legislators. Um, even, um, even if we don't see this happening through legislative initiative, there are other ways in which we should be looking at program criteria to try to project uh, how this may play out in, in racial terms. For example, if you have a drug court and you'd have to set up the eligibility criteria for participation, depending on which criteria you use, you may uh, screen out certain people or you may make it more expansive in terms of consideration. But you want to ask these questions up front rather than uh, 10 years down the road or so. Um, in broad terms, I think what we're really looking at is how do we level the playing field? And again, we're not going to eliminate poverty and racism tomorrow, but how do we allocate resources differently? How do we try to make our institutions into problem-solving institutions so that uh, when two people come before the judge at sentencing or before another decision maker, that they have roughly comparable odds of getting a reasonable response, whatever that may be uh, in that case. Uh, and it shouldn't depend on how much money you bring with you into court or the quality of the attorney sitting next to you or anything else like that. So how do we level the playing field? Part of that has to be a shift in resources. You know, we've been invested very heavily in incarceration over the last four decades at the expense of probation and parole and community building, so how do we begin to make a shift that gives us a better balance of approaches there? Um, let me close with um, just another sort of recent, relatively recent reference. Um, in the mid-1990s, um, <clears throat> this was uh, sort of just after we'd seen the sort of crime uh, significant increase in the late 80s, and a lot of that was related to these new drug markets and the like, but there were some very high-profile commentators who coined this new term, super predators. And super predators, as they defined it, was 
this coming wave of juveniles who, as they describe, is going to be, you know, much worse, much more violent, much more out of control than any wave of teenagers we'd ever seen before. Um, and they never defined it quite very precisely, but it's quite clear they were talking about young black boys is who they meant. And they got a lot of attention. You know, they were in the op-ed pages of the Wall Street Journal and various other places like that and talking about this coming crime wave. Um, well, a couple things happen on that. First, um, not long after they started talking about super predators, crime rates started to decline, particularly among juveniles and particularly among African American youth. So in terms of their predictive powers, uh, they weren't exactly on the mark. Um, but let's imagine for a moment that maybe they were correct. Let's imagine we had a group of five-year-old black boys is basically what they were talking about, and they were saying in 10 years, they're going to unleash this terrible crime wave. So if we as a community uh, were concerned about this problem of five-year-old boys, we had a sort of 10-year window of opportunity, what would we do over those 10 years to try to deal with this problem? Well, the first choice, I think we have two choices. The first one would be we could start to build prisons as quickly as possible so we'd have enough prison cells ready for them by the time they turn 15 or so. That would be one strategy we could try. The second strategy would be to say, okay, well, we've got 10 years to figure out what kinds of interventions, services, support we can provide, whether it's through schools, families, religious institutions, and others, to try to at least reduce the scope of problem that we're going to see 10 years from now. And 10 years is not a bad amount of time to try to work on some of these things. So what kinds of interventions could we provide that would begin to have an impact? Well, if it's our children that we're talking about, yours and mine, it's pretty clear uh, which of these uh, options we would choose. But unfortunately, uh, in a broader society, uh, we often make decisions, our leaders make decisions on other people's children and don't see the connection, don't see why we should treat other people's children the same way we would want to treat our children. And so I think part of our job is to open up that conversation so that we're talking about a broader community so that when we reach the point where someone else's child has the same opportunity as my children do, then I think we'll see much better outcomes overall. Thank you very much, and thank you again for all your wonderful work you're doing here.